But let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Kind Father, we thank you and we praise you for all things in Christ Jesus. We thank you for today, every blessing you've given us, all of your love, grace, and mercy that you've shown us uh, over the course of this day. You've just proven yourself to be uh, faithful. You've proven yourself to be who you said you would be. Uh, Jehovah Shammah, the God that's with us. Jehovah Jireh, the God who is our provision. Jehovah Shalom, the God who is our peace. And so we just thank you, Father, for uh, being with us. Thank you for protecting us from danger, seen and unseen, for helping us to fight battles that we are aware of, and God, for staving off attacks that we didn't even know that the enemy had waged against us. You're so good. You're so kind. And we love you for it. Thank you for these who are on uh, our live, on our Zoom tonight. I appreciate each and every person. I pray, God, that uh, today you would speak to each and every one of our hearts and our minds, that we might hear uh, your word, hear your voice, and that we might be made better uh, by hearing your heart and your will and your mind explain and express to us. Now, Father, let revelation knowledge flow, share your heart, reveal your mind. Any way you bless us will be satisfied. It is in the name of Jesus we pray and we boldly declare that the devil is defeated. God, you are exalted. Jesus, you are Lord. And I will agree with the prayer of the man of God said, hallelujah. Amen. And thank you, Jesus. Well, come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise uh, right there in the, uh, in the uh, comment section. Uh, let's praise our God for uh, all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all that he will do in the days to come, should our lives roll on. Mother Bertha Adams, blessings to you. Good to see you, Bishop Cameron Gresham. Hey, son, so glad that you're on. Uh, we appreciate uh, you coming on and sharing. And uh, Linda Gott Goodson Anderson, hello to you. Thank everyone. Tanya Hendricks. Hey, hey. Well, let's get started. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Most certainly we honor and reverence the spirit of our Christ. And we greet each and every one on in the name that matters most. That's the matchless and majestic name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Hey, Pansy Watson. Uh, the Bible does declare that uh, there's no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. And so we're thankful to be the recipients and beneficiaries of everything that comes in and with the name of Jesus, healing, deliverance, restoration, blessing, breakthrough, and all those things are still are still available in that name. Minister Diane Barnes, hello. And uh, Jasmine McCory, hello to you. Marilyn Hill, Otisa Maribel, good to see you. I pray that everything is going well with everyone who is on. Anthony Young, hey, sir to the whole Robinson family. Well, uh, before we move forward, uh, I do want to just thank those of you who give and who share in our time uh, of, of, of giving, in the ministry of giving, we appreciate you. Uh, most certainly ministry can't be made possible without money. And so for those of you who give, we say thank you. Hey, Kibo Keith, good to see you. Um, to that end, um, we do want to provide information that will be, uh, that will be necessary for you to continue to give and to sow uh, as uh, you purpose in your heart to do. Uh, we can give in several ways. And uh, my trusty assistant, Minister Diane Barnes, uh, has placed it in the chat there, mobile. Uh, you can text to give by texting the word give, G-I-V-E, uh, to area code 336-891-4023. You can cash app, uh, dollar sign church favor. You can give online, go to tci-charlotte.com, take your bank card, your credit card, your debit card, follow all of those prompts. And when you are instructed to give, uh, sow that seed. Uh, and also you can give by phone, 704-507-2397. Uh, and may the Lord God bless you real good as he watches over his word to perform it. He cannot lie, he will not repent. Uh, and as he, God tells us to sow, if we sow, that shall we also reap. Please understand that God watches over his word to perform it. He will do again just what he said. Mother Mary Reeves and Mother Irish Greer, good evening. Mother Judy Chisholm, the mothers are coming on. And again, uh, we thank God for uh, those who are on. Hey, Mildred Kimberly Don Lee, good to see you, daughter Shaquana Baltimore. Hey, daughter, love you more. Thank you for coming on. Well, let's get into the word. Um, I want to... Uh, 
first of all, kind of remind us that this will technically be the uh, the last Bible study of 2020. Uh, we um, it is our custom that on the month of, in the month of December uh, we um, we take time uh, just away from uh, our our fellowship during the week. And we kind of break it down and we let the, uh, you know, we let the year just kind of settle and sit where it is. And uh, we encourage the people of God to uh, go back over their notes throughout uh, that they've taken over the course of uh, 2020 and to reflect on those notes and to see how those notes have uh, impressed and impacted your lives for the better. And so, of course, um, we are encouraging you to do the same thing um, throughout uh, the month of December as uh, we are resting and uh, just um, enjoying the time uh, of coming to the end of another year. What a year 2020 has been. We'll, we'll continue to, of course, gather on Sunday mornings. We'll continue to stream and, uh, and do worship as we have done uh, throughout the course of this year, especially uh, since March and the uh, emergence of, of, of COVID. But we want you, please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, to, to govern yourselves accordingly. And so again, we won't be gathering live on our Bible study sessions. I would also encourage you to go back uh, over the course of December and watch the various Bible studies and do a review and, um, and go back and watch also those COVID conversations that were really insightful and enlightening um, so that you can um, continue to hear um, the word, that you can hear something that maybe you didn't hear the last time, that you can capture something maybe you didn't capture the last time. Uh, that is our encouragement to you uh, over the course of the month of December. Thank everyone who's coming on. Susan Harvin Peterson, still praying for you. Big sister, glad you're on. Bill Potts, hey, sir. Claudette Brown and Betty McKinney Williams. Um, th this is, um, t t tonight was uh, again scheduled to be our our Thanksgiving, a joint Thanksgiving service, and uh, some things um, just kind of fell through. And so uh, we're not doing the customary Thanksgiving service, but I do want to kind of speak to you uh, in a very, uh, hopefully very clear uh, way, yet uh, uh, probably a very different way from which you would expect a holiday, uh, a holiday teaching slash message uh, to, to come. Um, um, but I, I want to talk to you um, about literally preparing for 2021 as we are, as we are um, gathering for the last time on a Tuesday night for our Bible study session. Um, I want to use this time to just give you some, some pointers on how to uh, use the time that we have left to prepare for 2021. One of the uh, teachings that I did not long ago um, stressed the fact that um, you know, right now in 2020, we are in survival mode and uh, everything that's happened in 2020 COVID-19 and all of its, um, all of its um, effects, all of the, the things that have, that have happened as a result of, uh, of COVID-19, whether it be the, the shutdown of an economy, the loss of jobs, um, you know, the pandemic itself, um, causing some to fall ill and impacting their lives that way, creating uh, the need for people to give care to those who have, uh, who have um, uh, contracted um, the, the virus. Some people have succumbed to it. You know, uh, there've been deaths all across the world that have been reported and uh, and, and we talked about the fact that 
that we collectively, we've been traumatized um, and we are in the process of the trauma. And so we've had to adjust. And right now we are in survival mode. Uh, and I won't go back over all of that, but we are in survival mode, but hallelujah, trouble don't last always. And so we will uh, at some point uh, not return to normal, but we will, uh, we will find ourselves living in a new normal. We are literally, literally, we gonna make it, right? You know, whenever this is over, whenever, you know, the, the virus um, uh, is, is, is dealt with, however it's dealt with, um, uh, you know, lives will be normalized. Um, you know, we've had to deal with a lot of things by way of, uh, you know, the residual effects of uh, social unrest due to racial injustice and all of those things that we saw. Um, those things are going to also, um, they're going to fade and normalize them. I don't mean that they're going anywhere. Um, I don't see racism going anywhere in any, uh, in, in the foreseeable immediate future. Um, you know, we'll still be dealing with all of the social issues, especially as it relates to racism and, and racial injustice. But um, things will not be as, um, as overt. I'm hoping they won't be as, as overt as they were. So. Whatever, whatever the new normal is, we'll adapt to it. We will, um, we will emerge out of this um, having experienced a reset. That's what we've been talking about since March in one way, shape uh, or form or one way or another. We will experience a reset. And, um, and it is after all of this is over that we'll have to deal with our trauma. And so what I what I want to what I want to talk to you about tonight is um, concentrating now on achieving a healthy balance for 2021. Don't wait until 2021 to to try to fix the plane, right? Now that the plane has landed, uh, take this time, take the next uh, few days. T today is the 24th. There are 31 days in December. So technically we have about 36 days left. Take these, this time to, to focus forward, focus on uh, 2021, prepare now. As it relates to trauma, as it relates to the season that we're in, you know, not only are we dealing with the effects of COVID-19, but many of us are, you know, not only grieving those changes, but customarily uh, during the holiday, you know, we have to deal with grief. Grief of the loss of a loved one, grief of, grief of the loss of relationships, grief of the loss of, uh, of, of, of finances, you know, of a job, um, you know, those things are compounded now, right? We've, there's some of us who are on here um, that are dealing with um, recent losses um, of loved ones who maybe who've transitioned pre-COVID, but transitioned in the year 2020 or, or as recent as 2019. 2018, and uh, you know when you when you lose when a loved one transitions, when you lose a job, when a very important relationship to you uh, disintegrates, it doesn't matter when it happens. You're still dealing with the grief uh, of having lost those things and those persons, and so it is incumbent upon us. In, in the multiplicity of our trauma, in the 
uh, yes, housing, Tammy Williams, things that we've lost. So in the multiplicity of our, of our trauma, in the, in the um, abundance of grieving, you know, we, we have to understand that yes, God's grace is sufficient, his mercy endures forever, but God's not going to do it for us. It is God who, who, who is at work in us, both to will and to do according to his pleasure. Uh, the Bible says that we are laborers together with God. And so God is, will work with us to achieve the balance that we need to have going forward. Again, at the risk of sounding redundant, we're moving into a new normal and we can't do the work when the new normal happens, right? It's, it's already upon us, but it's in its infancy, it's in its genesis. We have to put in the necessary work, uh, the necessary work to achieve a healthy mental, emotional, uh, spiritual balance. It goes without saying that um, balance includes um, the material world as well. That, uh, you know, the things we talked about, eating right uh, and exercise and all those other things, those are inclusive uh, and included in achieving, ba in achieving balance. But I just wanna talk to you just drop a few nuggets on you about achieving balance now, building that foundation now, uh, focusing forward and putting in the work that we need to, to, uh, to bring healing to ourselves now. I've heard a few people say that uh, 2021 is the year of balance. My friend, uh, Pastor Keon Henderson in Houston uh, has been declaring that uh, 2021 is the year of balance. And uh, so I, I knew that when I saw that I was on the right path, when I saw that a little earlier today, as the Lord was speaking to me about what I'm gonna share with you, um, that we have to now focus forward on being balanced. Um, coming into the year of 2021, let me stress this again, God will help by the power of his grace through his ever enduring mercy. And because of his unconditional love for us, he will assist us, but he won't do it for us. So let's talk about a few things. And then I'm, you know, I'm not going to be on for a long time. And, and, and let's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in the context of the holy of, of, of the holiday season, right? Thanksgiving is upon us. Um, Christmas is fastly approaching. We're having to adjust during the time of, of, of the pandemic. Along with dealing with our own personal trauma and grief. So these things that I want to suggest to you um, on how to achieve balance going forward are merely suggestions, uh, but I, I pray that they make sense to you. And I pray that they uh, will help you as you sincerely and seriously consider the future that is ahead of you. And it's a bright future, I can promise you. Um, so here are my recommendations on how to achieve balance for 2021. Number one, I th it's number one, and I think is almost most important. Um, but number one, set boundaries. Set boundaries. Set boundaries. To achieve balance, we have to set boundaries. Now, again, let's look at this within the context of, of my opening statement that 2020, the majority of 2020 has been very traumatic. COVID-19, 
Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, all of those things that have happened um, on a national and even international scale, all of those things have traumatized us. Our personal traumas are still real, right? And in order to heal for the future, for the new normal, it's necessary to set boundaries. Now you've heard me teach from this uh, particular scripture that I'm going to reference now, but I wanna call your attention back uh, to the book of Joshua chapter five, Joshua chapter five. And I'm not gonna read this whole narrative, but I wanna, I wanna read um, just a few verses. Joshua chapter number five. Joshua chapter five, verse number eight. So let me set this up for you. Joshua's led Israel out of the wilderness across the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. And you know, Joshua chapter three, of course, of course they crossed the Jordan River. Joshua chapter number four, um, you know, they, they put up memorial stones um, in, in the camp where they were staying. And as they're moving forward, as they've crossed over into the land of promise in Joshua chapter number five, they get to this place that is known as AI. And what God does is God tells them to, um, and this is after the battle of Jericho. So they've shouted and the walls have come down. Uh, so after all of that has happened, um, God tells Joshua to circumcise them, to cut them, cut all the men, 21 years and younger, those men who were born in the wilderness who had not yet been circumcised. He said, cut them, circumcise them. And then in verse number eight, it says, so it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that stayed, they stayed in their places in the camp and they were healed. Verse nine says, then the Lord said to Joshua, this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Now here's, here's, here's what I'm saying. They, they move through the Jordan, and of course the Jordan is, is flooded. And so floods always represent, um, they represent some sort of traumatic experience. Um, whenever you see floods, remember the flood in the day of Noah, it traumatized Noah and it traumatized his family because everything, every living creature besides him and his family and those things that were in the ark, ark were killed by the flood. So a flood represents overwhelming trauma. So they go through this flood, they go through the flooded waters of the Jordan and they get to, they get to the camp. He tells them to circumcise all of the young men. He tells them to cut them. And he says, after they're cutting, make them sit down and heal. The word Gilgal, it's called the encampment. And the word Gilgal literally means the encirclement. So he says, set boundaries for them so that they can heal. Going into 2021, it's going to be so important for you. And I mean, starting now, and this may be a dramatic and drastic move for some of you, it's gonna be so important that you set boundaries. 
What do boundaries do? Boundaries set limitations. They, they limit movement, movement into your space, movement out of your space. And the way for you to heal going into this new season in your life is to set boundaries. And I taught on this a while ago. You honor them and you enforce them. Let me say it again. Set boundaries. Now, start about thinking, think about areas wherein you need to set boundaries. And whatever boundaries you set, you have to honor them. And you also have to enforce them or make other people respect the boundaries that you've set. That's what's going to help you to achieve balance in the days to come. Because if we don't, if we don't have boundaries, we will always find ourselves at an imbalance. We'll be out of balance. If we don't determine how far we'll go or how far we'll let people go, we will find ourselves out of balance. One of the things that COVID-19 did is um, in one way, it forced us to create boundaries, to become comfortable with creating boundaries. Stay six feet away from one another. Don't, don't, don't shake anybody's hand. When you're in somebody's presence, wear a mask. Businesses say you can't come in without the mask. So they create boundaries, right? And the boundaries are for your protection. It is going to be, if you're going to achieve balance, you have to create boundaries. Somebody put that in, in the chat. Boundaries. Boundaries on what you will and will not do. Boundaries on what you will and will not allow. Boundaries. Boundaries, uh, boundaries they create or they literally, um, they really, they literally designate territory. Boundaries say, this is the territory in which I operate. This is the type of territory in which you are allowed. This is what I will allow. This is what I won't allow. Create boundaries. Some of you, I was going to say COVID-19 aside, but you can't put COVID-19 aside. Some of those who are on this live tonight, you're not only, you know, grieving because of the holiday uh, and, and the losses that you've experienced, you know, due to things like transition and the demise of relationships, et cetera. You're not only grieving because of all that that, that COVID-19 and what this season has brought upon us in terms of collective trauma. Some people are grieving, depressed, whatever it is, because we didn't have any boundaries. And some of the letdown and some of the disappointment and some of the things that we're grieving now is because we were not careful to set boundaries. And here's what he says. If you're going to heal, if you're going to create, that's what healing is. Healing is the physical healing. Physical healing is the body coming back into balance, right? If, if a bone is broken, what do they do? They reset it. 
they reset it so that, uh, let's just talk about a, a, a broken leg. They reset it so that the weight that that, that that leg normally supports, it will be able to support again. As long as the bone is mending, you gotta hear this, as long as the bone is mending, you're having to shift the weight. You have to shift the weight to, to the side opposite of the broken slash mending bone. And God, God has designed the body so that when the body mends, when the body fixes itself, you're able then to transfer and I'm going to talk about this a little more in depth in a minute, to transfer the reasonable amount of weight back to that side because it's been fixed, right? But you got to create boundaries. You got to create boundaries so that you can heal. <laughs> I, I, I'll, never, I'll never forget uh, El, El, Elder Colbert, um, and, uh, and, and, and Nita and, and, and some others who, who've been at, at TCI uh, before I got there. I'll never forget when I first introduced taking the month of December all, you know, it was kind of a foreign idea. But once we started doing that, we saw people's lives coming back into balance. I'm gonna pick on Elder Colbert for a minute because you know, I, you know, she would just she just work, 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 church, 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 and she's still that way now. But she's she's a little less. Um, she's a little less out of balance because I designated December to be the month that we, you know, the office is closed. You know, you call, we check on the messages and all that kind of stuff, but nobody, no, nobody was there in the normal 11 month rigmarole, fixing what was broken, setting those boundaries. Don't come to church. Don't do any work, all that kind of stuff. So I, 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 I need you to understand your healing is your responsibility, right? There are things that you can't change. Like you can't bring back loved ones who've transitioned. You can't fix a relationship that has, that has ended, especially if it was God's will that it would. It's time ran out, it's season is over. So you can't go back and do those things, but what you can do is you can set boundaries so you can heal. Boundaries determine access. I, I won't stay the boundaries determine access. And here you are in 2020. Here you were, here you are in 2020. Many of you trying to heal, but but not, not controlling the access. And you you feel burnt out, worn down, scattered, all because you have not created bound. You haven't even created boundaries on yourself. Right? You let you. you we, we we've let this season get the best of us. Eat eat eat. Spin spin spin. No boundaries. Number two. Um, this really is good holiday teaching. This really is gonna help you heal. This is gonna be controversial, but I'm gonna tell it like the Lord give it to me as my, uh, as my late grandfather, the uh, Reverend A.J. Brewer would say, I'm gonna tell it just like the Lord give it to me. Build and invest in mutually beneficial relationships. Build and invest 
in mutually beneficial relationships. Oftentimes, when our lives are out of balance, it is because we are the predominant givers. We are the predominant helpers. We are the predominant, and I say this not in the messianic sense or not putting any of us on the level of Jesus, but we are the predominant savior. And so we're always giving, we're always pouring. And oftentimes we pour so much without being poured into that we pour out of an empty vessel. And what you need to determine now is that you are going to take survey of your life and begin to ask these questions. Who and what am I pouring into that's pouring back into me? Because you have to learn how to cultivate those relationships. This is not selfish. This makes good sense. Elder Barnes preached a phenomenal word Sunday. I got a word. I mean, man, he, listen, I wanted to just run in and tackle him and strangle him. He preaches so good. That good preaching make you want to act crazy. He, he talked about Elijah. But I want us to look at the relationship between Elijah and Elisha. And I want to examine something very quickly that will show us the importance of mutually beneficial relationships. All right. If this is making you uncomfortable, then I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I want you to look at 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. Y'all give me a few minutes and, and I'm, I'm gonna be out of here. Actually, 1 first, first Kings chapter number 17. First Kings chapter 17, of course, this is, is Elijah. Elijah gets his command from God. He goes to tell Ahab. He does what he says, he does what God says. God takes him on this, on this journey. And, and um, you know, after he speaks the word, and I'll come to Elijah, Elisha later, but after he speaks the word, and God has told him in verse number eight to go to a widow. And he's commanded the widow to sustain him. Now they're in a time of drought. And again, where there is drought, there is dryness, there is depression. It's a, it's a very, very dark time. God has sent Elijah to a brook so that he can drink water. He's assigned ravens to come, but the brook dries up, the ravens stop coming. Now he, he sends them to another place. And he says, I've commanded a widow to sustain you there. And when he goes, you know, he says to the woman, give me water. She goes to get water. Then he says to her, well, you know, bring me back some water. I mean, some, some bread. And he said, well, I ain't got, I ain't got no bread. I just got a little oil, a little meal. And uh, you and, uh, and my son and I are going to eat it and we're going to die. And Elijah says, if you make me a cake first, I promise you, y'all got to hear this. I promise you that my presence in your life and your presence in my life will be mutually beneficial. If you just make me a cake first, your, 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 your barrel of, 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 of grain will never be, will always be full and your cruise of oil will always be empty. That's first, that's first Kings chapter 17, 
starting at verse number eight. But let me show you this. So in verse number 15, it says, so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah and she and Elijah and her household, they ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the bar, bar of jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. So Elijah comes and, and Jesus talks about this um, in Luke. He says, Elijah, Elijah was only sent to one widow. He was sent to someone that he had already commanded to sustain Elijah. So he speaks about the mutual beneficiality of relationship. He came as the prophet or the presence of God. That's what, that's what the prophet represents, the presence of God. In Old Testament Israel, wherever prophet was, it represented the presence of God. He brings, he brings with him the presence of God. She has meal, oil, that if she obeys it and she feeds him, then she's going to be sustained throughout the entire drought. Along with you setting boundaries. I need you to even take a pencil right now. If you got pencil or pen and paper, start writing down, do two categories of relationships, which relationships are mutually beneficial and which relationships are one-sided. Because you will never, ever, 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 never heal as long as the relationships that you are in are one-sided. Seriously. That, that's, that's, that, that's what you have to think about going into how much time, how much energy, how many resources have you wasted in relationships that are not mutually beneficial? What are you hanging on to just for the sake of hanging on to it? that is profiting most from you, but you're not profiting anything from it. Now I'm gonna go deeper in a minute. So, you know, by the time we get to, by the time we get to, um, you know, the, the, the rest of Elijah's story, you know, he has in, in, in second Kings, I need you to turn there very quickly. In 2 Kings chapter 2, and you can start reading at verse 1. I'm not going to tell the whole, I'm not going to read the whole text. But Elijah chapter number 2, I'm sorry, first King, 2 Kings chapter number 2, verse number 1, it says, and it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel, but Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And so you, they, they read this when you get a chance. So they, Eli, Elijah says to Elisha, he says, I leave me, leave me. And Elijah says, Elisha says, or Elisha says, I'm not going anywhere. Now in chapter number one, you got to understand that uh, the, the, you know, the whole narrative is a story wherein um, Elijah has other people around him. It's the school of the prophets. They call them the sons of the prophet. But when Elijah said, I'm about to leave, those 50 leave him. When he has nothing else to give, when he says he's about to die, the 50 leave him. Elisha stays with him. And when you read chapter number two further, he stays with him and he understands the mutually beneficial relation, nature of the relationship. So much so that what, Eli what Elisha did when he met Elijah, he left, he left his father, he left all this, he, he, he cut up the oxen 
and he followed Elisha and he served him and he served him. Watch this. He served him um, from a pure heart, but he was receiving. He didn't even know everything that he was receiving. He didn't even know everything that he was gaining. He didn't know what he was absorbing at that time. And for the sake of, of brevity of time, Elisha stayed with Elijah until he was taken up. And remember he said, you know, what do you want from me before I go? He said, I, I'll give you a double. He said, I want a double portion of the anointing. I want a double portion of what makes you tick. He said, well, if you see me, when I go up, you get it. He goes up, he drops his mantle. His mantle is his, his vest, this long vest that he wears. Elijah is really, Elisha, I'm sorry, is really upset that Elijah leaves. And in being upset, he takes the mantle and he strikes the water of the Jordan and the water parts and he walks over on the Jordan. And the story is that Elisha or Elisha performs twice as many miracles as Elijah does because they are in a mutually beneficial relationship. Are you writing that list now? This is no time. Listen, you have lost enough in 2020 to teach you that, 20, that 2021 is no time for you to walk in false humility. You hadn't set up any boundaries. You gave, 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 and never received in return. You helped, 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 helped and would never help. You stretched yourself out, you wore yourself down, you poured out of an empty vessel and you can't continue 2021 in that way. Build and invest in mutually beneficial relationships. I'm going to come back in a minute and say something that seems to be contradictory, but it really isn't. But before I get to that point, let me get to this point. If you're going to build and invest in mutually beneficial relationships, this is just an expansion of and an expounding upon point number two. Point number three is you got to require people to bring something to the table, right? You have to require accountability. Require people to bring, if you're gonna achieve that balance, you gotta require people to bring something to the table. And it either has to be one, the same thing or a different thing in kind. Now the same thing, we talk about the same thing, the same thing would be if, if you're giving, if you're giving me money, I should give you money. That's the same thing. But something in kind would be something of equal value, but of a different substance. Of equal value, but of a different substance. You will never heal. You will never achieve balance. You will always be out of balance. If you don't require those who are in relationship with you to bring something to the table that is comparable to what it is you share. In my, in, listen, in my older age, they, they say you'll be, they, they, they say you'll be a better grandparent than your parent. And I think part of that is not just your relationship with your children's children, but your relationship with your children to help them in, in, in their parenting. 
And I'm understanding more and more now why my parents wanted me to do chores. Wasn't just to be disciplined, even though, you know, that's a part of it. <laughs> But they wanted me to learn to carry. They wanted you to learn to carry your weight within the context of that relationship. Right? They wanted you to make up your bed so they didn't have to. They wanted you to clean up your room so they didn't have to. And that was the earliest training that we received of requiring people to bring something to the table, either the same thing or something in kind, right? So when I was staying under that roof, I wasn't paying no bills, right? When I was in school, I wasn't paying no bills. But washing them, I washed the dishes so, so that mom alone didn't have to. You got it? I, I, you know, I did what, what, what dad alone asked me to do because he didn't have to. They were requiring me to bring something to the table within that which I was able to do. So let me ask you this. If you look back at 2020, how much did you require in terms of mutuality. For, let, let's look at first, I'm almost done. Let's look at first Corinthians. Chapter number nine. First Corinthians chapter number nine. This is Paul writing to the church of Corinth. First Corinthians chapter number nine. Here's what Paul says. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Paul said, we're giving you the best spiritually. <laughs> you don't have to give us what we give you because we've been gifted to give you something, he says, but you've been gifted to give us something. And this, you know, the, don't even let the devil mess with your mind. I ain't talking about money. Don't, don't worry about this. I ain't asking for a raise, TCI. None of that. But what I am saying is Paul is bold enough to say that when we consider life going forward, that it is incumbent upon us to require people to bring something to the, safe, the table. The table of our life, the table that we share together. This is not, listen, this coming year is not the year that you, that you take this passive position. Oh, well, they should understand. Well, if they understood, they would probably be doing it. And people will be as comfortable as you allow them to be in not stepping up to the plate, not carrying their weight, if you don't say anything or oh, well, they know they should be, well, maybe they, know, maybe, maybe they do know that they should be. And maybe they know that you know that they should be, but you need to let them know that you know that they should be and that they aren't. This is going, I'm telling you, this is going to help you to heal. It's going to help you to deal with the depression and I'll make people carry their Wait. Number four, I'm almost done. Number four, now this is going to sound like a contradiction uh, to um, number two and three, but it's not. Number four, if you're going to achieve balance in your life, in 2021, commit to a lifestyle 
of benevolence. Commit to a lifestyle of benevolence. Proverbs 11 verse 25 says, the liberal soul God makes fat and he that waters shall be watered also himself. So the liberal or the generous or the benevolent soul shall be made fat, shall be increased, shall be enriched. And those who water others or who, who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Now, benevolence is for the most part doing for those who can't do. Doing for those who can't do. Not those who don't want to do, but those who can't do. I'm reading the book again. I think I talked about this the other night. Uh, and we're going to read this book in 2021. It's a book called The Go-Giver. It's about how to prosper through giving. In order to achieve the proper kind of balance, you gotta be given to a lifestyle of benevolence. I posted today, today on Instagram, um, this little thought. And the thought is this, Helping others while you're hurting helps to heal you, right? So, so being compassionate and benevolent towards those who just can't help themselves, who may be in a bad situation right now, but want to be better. It brings healing to you. It brings balance into your life. So make up your mind now, you're going to commit to uh, a life of benevolence. Like, yeah, you're going to do you in 2021, but don't make doing you be all about you. Make it about being benevolent, compassionate to people who are really in lack and people who are really hurting. And oftentimes it will be people who you don't have any relationship with. You're just extending benevolence. It's an act of kindness. Sometimes there will be people that you're connected to who need, you know, who need help getting back on their feet and who are sincere about it. But in order to bring your life into balance, in order to help with, with the process of grieving the traumas that you have experienced, make sure that you commit to a lifestyle of benevolence. Here's the last point and I'm done. In order to achieve balance in 2021 and for the rest of this holiday season, this is probably, this, this is the one, I saved this one for last. So if y'all gonna be mad at me, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna read the comments. I'm gonna turn my phone off and I'm gonna go to sleep. Y'all can be mad on me, mad at me in the chat. I ain't, I ain't gonna see it. You gotta get rid of baggage. Get rid of baggage, emotional baggage, spiritual baggage, psychological baggage. Get rid of the baggage. Did you know that, that grieving during the holiday season, and we all do it, is compounded by the other baggage we pick up or the baggage that we held before the uh, traumatic event that made us grieve? We're holding on to that. So we, we either put in the grief and the trauma on top of the baggage, or we're putting um, the trauma on top of, the trauma and the grief on top of the baggage 
that we did not discard before we experienced what we experienced. You gotta get rid of the baggage. Like this, this is, ought to be a time of introspection. Like I ought to be looking at myself, examining myself and seeing how much emotional baggage I am carrying, I've been carrying. I have to look at myself and see how dysfunctional and self-destructive I am to me. I gotta get rid of the baggage. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and we're done. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. And I promise we, we finish. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number one. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so a great, so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand of God. I'm seeing comments that are definitely profound comments, profoundly supportive of what I'm saying and what I'm about to say. I see comments saying I have a rough time around the holidays. I miss my mom, passed away at 17. She's 30, 31. Shana Monique, I'm praying for you. Um, I see other comments, Tanya Hendricks, that's huge. Lord help us. Charlotte Stevenson Tatum, come on Bishop. Deborah Green, my brokenness is breaking me. Angela Renee Mingo Belfield, hey cousin, my sister cousin, sit with yourself. At, here's, here's what this text says. The encouragement in verse number one tells us that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. The witnesses are the people who've gone on before uh, the writer of Hebrews um, audience. He spends all of Hebrews chapter 11, the majority of Hebrews chapter 11, in, 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 in describing what is known as the Hall of Fame of Faith, the forefathers and foremothers in Israel. You know, he, he, he starts with Abel. He moves down to Noah. He talks about Moses. He talks about all of the forefathers. He talks about Rahab. He talks about the, the four parents who have gone before them. And he said, they, they are a great cloud of witnesses. They are watching you. They are cheering for you. They want you to make it. He says, but in order for us to make it, we got to deal with our own baggage. Lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Introspection, examination, self examination. You get through blaming people for whatever you blaming them for. It will always come back to you. When I get through blaming people for whatever I'm blaming them for, it will always come back to me. When we get through blaming people that whatever for whatever we're blaming them for, it will always come back to us.
And again, grief is normal. Grief due to loss and what, whatever reasons we grieve, it's normal. But the text says, the folk who have gone on before you, who are cheering you on, their cheers will not help you unless you deal with your baggage. Their cheers will not help us unless we deal with our baggage. This may seem kind of, you know, utopic to some of you, but even when loved ones have transitioned, at some point, a certain degree of healing should have taken place that the memories of those who've transitioned don't push us deeper into the depths of depression, but those memories of their example, of their deposits, of their investments should raise us up. I know this is, this is tough, but I'm telling you, I'm doing my own share of grieving. Had my own share of trauma that has made me grieve. And I'm not lifting myself up as a model of perfection. But I will say this, that this teaching is birthed out of a revelation that says that my healing is my responsibility. My healing is my responsibility. <laughs> I ain't gonna tell y'all while I'm laughing. Healing is my responsibility. <laughs> my healing, <laughs> my healing is my responsibility. <laughs> my healing is my responsibility. The the the, the people, and I'm done. Many of the people who we're grieving, if they were parents, that sole and total goal and objection or objective was to, was to um, prepare us to live without them. That's what Big Mama and, and Big Will, you know, whatever you call your grandma, your granddaddy, it, that's what they that's, that's what they raised our parents to do, to live, to be parents, to live without them. And our parents raised us to be able to live without them. And our loved ones invested in us so fervently. So that if they were to leave before us, it would be it would be the um, the the lessons that they taught, the example that they left, that would enable us to carry on that legacy of love, that legacy of of support and help. 
We had to deal with our own baggage. It ain't going to get better. And I'm telling you. Um, with, with COVID and everything that's happened in 2020, compounding all the other stuff, we got to take this seriously. They are predicting a rise, a rise in mental illness and suicide and all this stuff based upon our collective trauma. We don't have to be in the number. I pray that each and every one has a happy, in as much as possible, a happy Thanksgiving. But know that it's not going to be happy unless you put your fair amount of effort and energy into it being so. My time is up. Thank you for yours. Let's pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for all things. We thank you for this moment. As God, we are on the precipice of the beginning of another holiday season. The traditional holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas where customarily we gather, we gather in our, in our pockets with our loved ones. And God, we don't deny the fact that many of us are experiencing grief because loved ones have transitioned, situations have changed, circumstances are different. And while we're yet in the midst of a pandemic, we won't be able to do things as we normally have done them. But remind us, Father, that your joy is our strength. Remind us, Father, that you have given us a sufficient grace. Your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Remind us what your word says, that those of us who, who grieve the loss of loved ones, we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Father, we thank you now for your mystical healing power. We know that you through your power can do anything. We know that you can mend broken hearts, that you can renew, refresh, revive, and reinvigorate bruised and crushed spirits. But you've also given us imperatives in your word. You've told us things to like rejoice and be exceedingly glad. You've told us that even though we would have tribulation in this life, we should be of, we should decide to be cheerful. Give us the grace to make that decision. Help us to put every event of our lives in perspective. Help us to realize what it means when your word says all things work together for our good. If we love you and are the called according to your purpose. Even Jesus told his disciples, it was good for me. It is good for me, for you that I would go away. Because if I don't, I can't send back the essence of who I am to live in you. So Father, let the healing begin. Pour out an abundance of grace. 
Help us, God, to love on one another, to encourage one another. Don't allow us to become so self-centered that we become cold and callous. Cause us to be compassionate, Father, but on the other side of the coin. Help us by the power of your grace divine. God, to restore and encourage ourselves and not put the weight, the responsibility on others to produce happiness in us. Bless each and every one, God, under the sound of my voice. So many have experienced recent transitions. Be compassionate, Father. Be benevolent. Show your goodness. Now, Father, if there be any among us who are sick in any way with any area of their lives, we release healing in the name of Jesus. We declare it and decree it. Make them whole. Make them well. And Father, I pray now, we pray, God, for Elder Tim Griffith. Thank you for how you're raising him up, how you're strengthening him. You who began a good work in him shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, continue to do your work in him until he returns back to us whole, well. In the name of Jesus. We love you now, Father, and we desire to love you more. It's in Jesus' name we pray now, and we boldly declare the devil is defeated. God, you're exalted. Jesus, you are Lord. Father, you give your beloved sweet sleep. And so we declare and decree sweet sleep for those who will lay down tonight, who will retire. And then tomorrow morning when they wake up, calls them to wake into a new mercy. And those who have to work through the night, if there be any on this live, we pray now, Father, in the name of Jesus, that their night will go by smoothly and swiftly, that it will go off without a hitch, that they would remain awake and alert, and that God, as many of us are waking up to a new mercy, they would lie down in that mercy and sleep a sleep of comfort and peace until you awaken them again. Now, God, bless our families, however we gather, let your joy abide. In Jesus' name we pray. We boldly declare the devil is defeated. God, you're exalted. Jesus, you are Lord. And I hope agree with the prayer of the man of God. Shout it hallelujah. Amen and thank you, Jesus. Family, love you so much. Have a great night tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Uh, our prayers, you, the number, the, the, uh, the code uh, is on our website. And uh, we pray that you would join us for prayer. Look, I love you with a never ending love. I thank God for you. And I appreciate each and every one of you. Have a great night. Take care. <laughs>